Welcome, you are here to learn how to play Baldur's Gate. Let's get into it. First thing that you're going to do is create a character. And of course, you've got a list of different things that your character is going to have. First of all, being a gender. Now, luckily, being a video game, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, this has zero effect on your gameplay. It's purely visual. So choose whatever gender that you want and then press done. And then of course you have a custom portrait and you can pick whatever you want for your portrait. That's a good one. The next thing that you're going to be picking is your race. Your race will determine a couple of things, and if you select each one as you go through them, it'll actually tell you down here what exactly the effects of that race is. Like dwarves, for instance, plus one constitution, minus one dexterity, minus two charisma, with a couple of other things. Now, you might notice that human has nothing about it, but there is actually a thing with humans, which it actually does describe here, they have the ability to dual class, but they cannot multi-class. Multi-class is forbidden for humans. It is only for elves, half-elves, and dwarves, and the like. Dual classing simply means that you can pick one class, and if your stats are at the required levels, you can dual class into another class. For example, if you're a fighter, you can dual class into a thief if you have the required stats, to be a thief, but then you are stuck as a thief for the rest of the game. So say you get to like a level seven fighter and they're like, you know what, I wanna do a class and do a thief. You can do a class and start becoming a thief and you start at level one as a thief and then you start leveling up as you progress through the game and you'll surpass the level of your fighter class but you won't ever level up the fighter class ever again. You're stuck with Thief for the rest. But you still get to keep the benefits that you gained as a fighter class once you reach that same level as your dual class. So we're just gonna jump in as human and you're gonna select your class and each class will have a whole bunch of different restrictions and benefits, all of which will be talked about down here. As a beginner, I usually recommend fighter or ranger, maybe even paladin, strictly because they tend to be really strong. Archers in Baldur's Gate 1 in particular are very, very strong. Archers are like your highest DPS class in Baldur's Gate 1. And they're still very powerful leading into Baldur's Gate 2 as well. So bear that in mind. I usually recommend fighter also because it's really easy. You just get the best equipment that you can and you click on enemies and you run at them and you hit them. It's as simple as that. Each class has a class kit and each kit has, again, benefits and disadvantages. Like Berserker, for instance, they get the rage ability, but their disadvantages is they can't specialize in ranged weapons. They're restricted to non-lawful. Your alignment has certain factors at the beginning of the game, but don't worry too much about your alignment. Just pick whatever you want and as long as you're not like murdering children in the game, you won't encounter too many problems. If you pick fighter and you look at this Kensai class and you might think, oh, well, this seems very, very strong. You get two bonus to your armor class, which is great. Plus one to hit and damage rolls every three levels. Wow, that's incredible. Minus one bonus to speed factor every four levels. Now you might think minus one, well, does that mean you're attacking slower? No, minus one just actually means you're attacking that little bit faster every four levels. So it actually makes, means you're attacking faster. And you might think, oh, that's really, really strong. But then the disadvantage is, is you can't wear any armor. You can't use missile weapons. You can't wear gauntlets or bracers and your alignment's restricted. But again, don't worry about that. And so it's like, at first, it is extremely weak. It is only much further in the game where Kensai becomes absurdly strong. And you'll also have to make sure that you build your stats properly. Otherwise, you might be pretty weak. We'll actually select Kensai so I can show you why. Alignment, we're just gonna pick not lawful good. There is a reputation system in Baldur's Gate and that determines things like item prices and merchants. And there are certain interactions with NPCs that are based on a dice roll. And depending on your reputation, it'll have different effects, but there are very, very few of these instances. And so for the most part, I would just say, don't worry about that at all. So now we're gonna go into our abilities. This is where people tend to spend the vast majority of their time on character creation, because you want to be re-rolling and storing high rolls. Like just pay attention to this bottom total roll here. I mean, if you want for role play purposes, just like roll a couple times and then just go with whatever number that you get after, after messing with these, then go for it. But spend at least five to 10 minutes rolling, trying to go aim for around 85. 85 is kind of hard to hit, 
But anything like 82 to 86, if you're in that range, you'll be pretty solid. Some people get ridiculously lucky rolls like 95. And one thing to note, if you're a fighter class and you want high strength, because fighters want high strength, you'll see when you max out strength to 18, you'll get this strange slash number. So like slash 19. When you hit 18 strength, there's like the secondary strength factor. At different integers of that factor, it'll have different effects, like you'll be hitting harder or you'll be able to carry more. Sometimes you might hit an 18 zero, zero, and you might think, well, that's the worst one. Actually, no, that's actually the best one because it's almost like you have 19 strength. So if you manage to actually get a roll where you get to have a really like an 18, where you get to have an 18 zero, zero, and if it's still a high roll, keep those stats. Even if it, even if it may, might not be that high, it's probably pretty good to keep. However, there are these books in the game called tomes and when you discover them and identify them and use them, they'll actually increase a stat point depending on what type of tome it is by one. And so there is a strength tome in Baldur's Gate 1. It might take you a long time to find it, but it's in the game. And if you have 18 strength, then you can just use that tome to get to 19 strength. So you don't really have to worry too much about this 18 number, but it is nice to have early on. All right, so now I've finally rolled a fairly high number, 85. That's what I like. So for a fighter class, let's let's actually just take a moment and go through the stats real quick. So strength, that determines things like your to hit roll, how much damage you're doing, how much you can carry, which is actually a pretty big factor because there are a lot of items in this game that are pretty heavy and it's nice to have characters that have high strength so that they can actually carry all your junk. Dexterity will determine your to hit armor class and that is how well you're able to not get hit by enemy attacks. That's pretty much its main purpose. The higher your dexterity, the harder it is for enemies to hit you. Constitution plays a factor in how high your maximum hit points are and also determines how many hit points you gain per level. Intelligence has a number of effects on the game. First of all, it has to do with whether or not your character can use a wand or a scroll. It requires at least nine intelligence to be able to use wands or scrolls. Second would be your lore bonus. Intelligence and wisdom both have effects on your lore bonus. And lore is essentially just your chance of identifying an unidentified item without using a scroll or a spell. It also determines how long you'll get stuck in the maze spell if you get hit by a maze spell, although that's pretty rare in the first game. Actually, I would actually say it's probably never going to happen to you. I don't recall any instances that it ever happens except uh, maybe one or two two so i wouldn't worry about that for intelligence it also determines your mind flare resistance because there are mind flares in the second Baldur's gate game they are not in the first so it's not really any worry about the first game but they are in the second game so it is also nice to know intelligence can determine how well you can resist their psychic attacks Intelligence also determines certain dialogue checks, but they are very rare in Baldur's Gate. There's only a very small handful of intelligence checks, and they have no real impact on how the quests go. So don't really need to worry about your intelligence if you're not a mage. They also determine how many spell slots that a mage can have. So the higher your intelligence, the more spells you can cast on your mage. So pump that intelligence score if you're going to be using any spell casting characters. So we're just going to leave it at three and then we're just going to bump up our strength We've got a nice 1856. That's actually not too bad. Dexterity, we're just going to max to 18. Constitution, just because we're a fighter, we're a Kensai, we want these three to be maxed out as much as possible. And then next as a fighter, we don't really care too much for wisdom. You can lower that however much that you want. It's not going to really play any kind of factor. And charisma, we might as well just bring that up. Charisma does, in fact, have an impact on certain interactions and also has a determining factor for item prices. You'll get better prices at merchants with a higher charisma. Wisdom is for clerics what intelligence is to mages. 
Wisdom determines how many spell slots that you have as a cleric. So this looks pretty good. We're going to go ahead and accept those stats. They're pretty much min-maxing stats right there. And then you're going to go into your skills. And your skills is just how well you want to be able to hit stuff with a particular weapon. Now let's say I want to be able to hit stuff with an axe very easily. So you put some pips into axe. And at first level, you can only put a maximum of two as a fighter. Most other classes can only put one. And when you skill one of these, it'll actually pop up down here and tell you how many slots or pips that you put into it, what exactly that does. So if I put one into it, that means I can use the weapon with no penalties. If I put two in, I get plus one to hit, plus two to damage for and for warriors only, an extra half attack per round with the selected weapon, which is not bad. You kind of want that. Now you might notice there's also these styles of proficiency as well. So there's two weapon style, which is dual wielding. If you're going to be dual wielding, you definitely want to max this out as fast as you can because even at maximum level your offhand still has a negative two penalty so you just want to get rid of those penalties as quick as possible having two slots into it at least removes any penalty from your main hand single weapon style i almost never see used essentially it means that you're using a one-handed weapon and no shield and so this is just, I guess, for role-playing purposes, if you don't want to use a shield for whatever reason, you can scale this and then you'll actually get some bonus to your armor class. And it also means you get critical damage on a roll of 20 or 19. Ultimately, stat-wise, it's not worth doing that. It's better to do sword and shield style. However, as a Kensai, we cannot actually do sword and shield style. There would be a sword and shield style here if I were a normal fighter, but being a Kensai, I do not have that option. I only have two-handed weapon style, which is you get some bonus to damage and speed with a two-handed weapon. So as a Kensai, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go one into two-weapon style or eh, maybe two into two-weapon style. You know what? Let's just go two into two-weapon style because I think as a Kensai, the more weapons you have in your hands, the better. And I think for my main weapon of choice, I'm going to have to go with the longsword. Baldur's Gate 1 doesn't have very many great options for weapons. I think the most powerful weapon in the game is the long sword or it's a two-handed sword. Baldur's Gate 2 does a lot better with more weapon variety. Like there's an axe that's insanely strong. There's a hammer that's utterly ridiculously strong in Baldur's Gate 2. In Baldur's Gate 1, long swords and war hammers and two-handed swords are pretty much going to be your best options. Or of course long bows because bows in Baldur's Gate 1 are just flat out overpowered. We're going to continue forward with long sword dual wielding. You can pick your appearance and you've got a lot of options and I mean your appearance is purely for your own personal aesthetics liking so if you want to be red skin with blue hair go ahead it it really doesn't make much of a difference. I think that's good we're uh, the main character of an anime and then of course you've got your voice sound effects and it's just personal preference. And then, of course, you get to name your character. And so just put your name here and we're good to go. Now, there are a number of difficulties in this game. So if you just want to experience the story of Baldur's Gate, if after this video, you still don't have any idea what you're doing, just go ahead and click story mode. It's a great story. It's honestly one of my favorite games of all time, and it's totally worth playing just for the story. But if you do want to have some amount of difficulty, there's a lot of options to choose from. I always prefer playing on tactical because that's the way the game was designed to be played. Do not, if you are new to the game, ever play Legacy of Ball. It is a nightmare. I actually beat it solo with, with a solo character. However, when I did so, I had a glitch happening where the health values of the enemies were not actually functioning properly i think that is now fixed so enemies have ludicrous amounts of health even rats will kill you it is that absurd don't ever play legacy of ball all right so this is your opening screen for when you first pop into the game you're in front of this inn right here it's candle keep in and the game essentially wants you to go inside and go buy some gear you've got this little text area here your list of party members on this side and you've got some buttons down here this button at the bottom selects them all this button will turn your party ai on and off that's something we could go over later this reveals details 
And so that's an activatable. So it's like, oh, there's a door there or there's a tutor right there. So we can toggle that on and off. There's another button for it, which is tab, I believe is the default. If you hold down tab, it'll pop up all that information as well. Very useful button. Spacebar pauses and unpauses, and you'll want to use that a lot because there's a lot of things happening on the screen at the same time when you're fighting, and you want to be able to make sure that your party members are doing what you want them to be doing. Over at the bottom left, we've got quick save, very useful. You want to be clicking that all the time, or the shortcut is Q. We can press that a lot of times, and the game does a really fast job of quick saving. We've got a little help button, which I have never used ever, but it will tell you what things are. This bottom button right here is just the rest button. And then of course you've got like this little ticking clock thing and that's also a pause button. So let's take a quick look at each of these options right here. We've got our map and we can see map notes on, you can toggle that on and off. We've got priest quarters, temple of Agma, the storehouse, clinic, bunkhouse, barracks, candle keep. And so usually these will pop up if there's like certain areas of interest that you want to make note of. You can also toggle the background. This will show you walkable area. So anything that's not highlighted is not walkable. I've never really used that for anything, but there it is. The next one down, we have our journal. You can have little drop downs for important events. And so each chapter in the game will have like its own section for your quests and stuff. And so we've got this one quest. We must leave Candlekeep immediately and set out on a journey. We've got some gold and we need to purchase some supplies before heading out. So we've got quests and then we've also got a journal. The journal seems to just be used to like be able to add your own personal, I did this today. Wow, look at me. And then you can click done. I've never used that. So it's kind of up to your own personal discretion whether or not you want to use your journal. Mostly I just use quests to be able to keep track of what exactly am I doing? Where do I need to go? That sort of thing. The next one down is very important. This is your inventory screen. So we've got a lot of information and a lot of stuff going on here. So quick rundown. These are quiver for arrows and bolts. These are all armor slots around the character like rings. We've got our secondary slot for a shield or a second weapon, amulet, helmet, gauntlets, cape, boots, girdle, or belt. We've got quick items. So that's where you were potions or scrolls would go, certain books. You've got your quick weapons. So this is where you can store all sorts of different weapons and fighters get four slots. So you can put a lot of different weapons on a fighter. Most other classes only have two, maybe even just one. And then you've got all this information up here. So up here, you've got your armor class, which is, we've got an armor class of four. And the way Baldur's Gate works is the lower the number, the more difficult it is for enemies to hit you. They have to get higher rolls on their dice to be able to hit you the lower your armor class is. Next is, of course, you're just health. You've got 14 out of 14 with a 18 constitution fighter. Then you've got your to hit armor class zero classification. And this is how easily you manage to hit other creatures. And this also runs where the lower it is, the higher the chance of you hitting other things is. And then of course, you've got your damage with whatever weapon that you've got currently selected. And so we've got 49 damage with a quarter staff. Because our strength is so high, we have a plus three strength modifier to our damage. So we've got a 1d6 is the damage on our quarter staff. And I got into this menu with the quarter staff just by right clicking. And so 1d6 crushing damage. Now there are different types of damage in the game. There's crushing, piercing, slashing, and different armors will have different armor class bonuses to different damage types. That's something to pay attention to when you're looking at armor because different armors will have different armor classes for different types of damage. So one piece of armor might be really good against slashing damage, but not as good against crushing damage. So let's go inside and do our first interaction with the innkeep here. And you're just left clicking to move and you're just left clicking to interact with people. And there's a lot of inns in the game and you'll always get this pop-up screen for like sleeping in rooms and different rooms will actually heal you different amounts. But there's an option in the game to heal party to full on rest, which if you have that enabled, it will use up your healing spells and stuff. And so it will rest for as long as you need 
to restore those spells and use them to heal yourself to full in one go. Otherwise, you'd just be resting over and over and over to heal your party. And that's kind of annoying. So I believe that's enabled by default, but I could be wrong. But just make sure that you have that enabled in your options. So we can go to our options. We can go to our gameplay. And if we look through here, yes, rest until healed. It's right here. And you just want to make sure that is enabled. Then it will repeatedly cast healing spells on rest until fully healed. Otherwise, currently memorized healing spells are cast once on rest. Apparently it doesn't work in multiplayer. Also, I forgot to go through the rest of these, but first we're going to talk to Winthrop before we continue on with that. So being a dual wielding Kensai fighter with a specialization in longswords, what I pretty much want to do is I just want to find the longswords. There they are. And I'm going to buy three of them. One thing to note in Baldur's Gate 1 is that until a certain point in the game, iron weapons have a fairly decent chance to disintegrate because there is stuff going on that you will find out as you play the game. And so you'll want to make sure that you've got backups unless you have a magical weapon. Magical weapons won't just randomly disintegrate or break, but iron weapons early on in the game will break fairly commonly. So you just want to have backups with you. There's a third tab here to get drinks and you'll get certain rumors and stuff. And so you'll get some bits of lore and also hear about certain events or possible quests in other areas that you can go and investigate. I have essentially never used this, but it's a fun little role-playing mechanic and it might be interesting to play around with. Now I'm also going to go ahead and buy some, oh, if you were a normal fighter, you'd probably also want to go ahead and buy some armor but because I'm a Kensai, I cannot use armor or shields or helmets. So there's no point in actually for me to buy anything other than swords. And because of that, I have so much money. I'm going to go ahead and just buy some more long swords. And I'm going to equip them. Just left click, drag and drop. So let's move on with the rest of these over here. So the record tab here gives you a ton of information about your character or whichever character that you have selected. If you've got other members in your party, you would just select them up here and then their stats would appear over here. So we've got our information page. So we've got our name, we've got all of our attributes, and then we've got a long list of stats. A lot of this information isn't particularly useful. It more or less just tells you how strong you are at this current time with what you currently have equipped. It gives you stats on certain on like certain ability bonuses, like because of my strength, I've got plus two to hit, plus three damage. I've got a score of 30 for my chance to force open locked doors. I don't think it means 30%. I don't really know exactly how that stat works, but that's just what it is. Then you've got your weight allowance, so I can carry a total of 250 pounds without being encumbered. I've got an armor class of negative four because I'm a Kensai. And then you've got You've got your other information tabs up here, like class. You'll be able to see what uh, your particular kit is all about. You've got combat stats, which is all your combat stats. You've got skills, which tells you like your lore and your reputation, and I guess other things once you have skills, but fighters tend not to have very many skills. And then of course your abilities, which is, again, a lot of this is just all in this tab as well. One tab that I do find kind of fun is stats because it will actually tell you like, time spent with the party, what your favorite spell is, what your favorite weapon is, your total experience value in the party, your total kills in the party, the experience value of your kills, your number of kills, and I and and then of course your most powerful vanquished and so the game actually keeps track. I don't know how the game determines what the most powerful creature is in the game, but it has something that determines that and so if you kill something particularly powerful, the game will track that and be like, oh, this is the most powerful enemy that this character has vanquished. And then you've also got a biography right here, which is just more lore stuff. The next tab is a mage book. That's useful if you're a mage. That's where you learn your spells. The next is your priest scroll book, which is for your clerics and druids, which is where you select or deselect your priest spells. Now for the beginning of the game, I would certainly encourage you to check out each of these little spots that are highlighted in some way. They'll help you learn the game, get you used to the way it works. But if you really don't want to bother with all the riffraff, then you can simply come straight over here into the center. And that is where you will begin the rest of the game. 
One other quick thing that I think is important to cover after learning that someone did not really understand how to do this. When you are traveling around and exploring the world of Baldur's Gate, it's important to realize that in order to navigate through the world, you actually have to travel at different uh, sides of the map to get to certain locations. For instance, I'm at the bottom of the map in this particular location. And if I go down, I can now access these two locations down here. Now there's nothing that I see to the sides, but if I go and try to travel from the left side of the map right here, this location is now visible and now I can travel to that. And so if I go here and let's just very quickly travel to the top through some cheats and then go to the top, now we can travel to this location. And so that is how you navigate through the maps in Baldur's Gate. So I'm skipping a fair bit into the game here, and I just want to go over some party management and combat stuff real quick. We saw earlier that there's this toggle party AI button, and so let's actually turn it on. Now the thing that determines your AI is actually here in your records, and that will be under the customize option. Under customize, you can actually change your appearance and you can change your sound, your colors, but what determines your AI is your script. And different scripts will do different things for different types of classes. And so it's got a long list of all of these things and you might want to take some time to look into it or just pick the particular script that seems would best fit the class of the character that you are changing the script for. With the enhanced edition, they've got this advanced AI and it's very customizable. You can actually tell it's like, well, I want to do this and I want to do that and attack enemies or prefer melee weapons or prefer range weapons or I want them to stay very far away or use turn undead, stuff like that. And so that can be very useful to have. I like to just have it on standard attack, which just means that if the AI is running, then they will simply attack with whatever weapon they have currently equipped the nearest enemy on their own. And I like using that just so that they're doing something at least. And then if I need to nudge them in one direction or another, I can do that and they won't be doing some strange thing. However, if I do select advanced AI for all my characters here, I do have some spell casters. We can watch what they tend to do when we end up in a fight. So let's just go into a fight and see what happens. We can already see that one of my characters, who is a thief, is automatically detecting traps for us. And here's a good fight. Let's just walk right into it and then see what our characters do. I don't want them to attack just yet. I want them to be in the middle of this fight. Alright, we're going to have them stop right here. Automatically, someone has already cast a spell, which is called Shot on our Ranger. I have pause on spell cast turned on. This is something I really like to have turned on so that when a spell is finally cast, you can order your character to do something else, cast another spell or to attack. So as you can see, our characters cast a whole bunch of spells and they're doing a whole bunch of stuff and automatically attacking all of the enemies for us. I didn't have to do anything in this fight they did it all. However, they did cast some spells that were very unnecessary for this kind of fight. Right now, I'm actually pretty dang high level, and these enemies right here are kind of pathetic, especially for the level I'm at. So it was very unnecessary to cast the sort of spells that we cast. So that is why I tend not to recommend using advanced AI. However, if you just want your spellcasters to do stuff on their own without you bothering to order them around, I would just go ahead and use advanced AI and tell what kind of spells you want them to use and then maybe you can micromanage them a little bit more on your own. But that is pretty much the basics of combat and all of these screens and the stats and all of that information. And finally, before I close out the video, I just want to say that Baldur's Gate is really a game about exploring. It's about going out and finding what's out there. Honestly, Baldur's Gate is one of my favorite games of all time, and I've played through the... <laughs> I've played through the first game about five, seven, five to seven times. I, I think it's around seven. And each time I find something new. There, there's always something new to discover in Baldur's Gate. 
The second game is a little bit more linear than the first one. The first one is very, very much so about exploration, although the second one has quite a lot of that too. But still, it is a game that wants you to delve into it, to explore, to find things over and over and over. So keep that in mind. If there's anything that you are having trouble with, feel free to leave a comment below and I will do my best to answer it. Before I close out this video, I'm gonna show you a couple of little bits, which is just a couple of hidden item locations that you otherwise might miss. And they can actually be quite helpful if you just wanna sell them and get a lot of gold at the beginning, or if you just want a really nice, solid, powerful item very early on. And if you wanna go in completely blind, then you can ignore the rest of this video. So the first item will be in the very first map after you leave Candlekeep, and it'll be just along the road. It'll be in this tree right here, and if you hold down your tab button or your reveal button, it will highlight this little section right here, and you'll find a diamond. They're worth a fair bit of money, so it's nice to have a little jump start on money. So that's the first item right there. The next item is in the map directly afterwards. You'll be coming along this road here and you'll reach this little statue right here and you'll want to go straight north from here. Although be careful, you might encounter some enemies along the way. And there's a little, oh, there's an enemy right there. We're gonna to try to avoid him. And there's this little rock in this clearing. And if you hold down shift again, you'll find that there is a little hidden object in here and it is a ring of protection plus one. Now you can identify it later on or if you are a mage and have the spell identify, you can identify it right away and you can sell it for a fair bit of money. Or if you would like, because it is just a ring plus one, you can just immediately equip it and you'll get a little plus one or negative one bonus to your armor class, which is nice to have. The next item is at the Friendly Arm Inn location, and it's right near the beginning of the entrance when you first come to the inn. All you have to do is start going to the right. There's a bunch of trees, and then there's this big, like, evergreen-like tree. And if you hold down tap, you'll see there's another little nook and cranny hiding right there. And what do we have here? This is a ring of wizardry. You'll have to identify it, but this ring is very, very powerful for mages. I believe it doubles their level one spells, or you can identify it and then sell it for about 9,000 gold, depending on your reputation, of course. And so that is a massive gold boost at the beginning of the game, if you so want such a nice gold boost. The next and final item is in the town of Nashkel. It is not really that hard to get to. At the beginning of the game, you start out here and you can make your way down all the way to Nashkel right here. And then this is the map. You'll start up right here. And if you make your way down across the bridge and into this farm field and over this little tree right here, you'll find again, this little nook and cranny, you'll find a pearl and ankeg plate armor. Now this is some pretty good plate armor. It is, I believe third or fourth best armor in the game. I might be wrong about that. I think it's somewhere in like top five best armors in the game. And it's really nice to have early on. And that's it for tips and tricks on easy ways to get really good items or some nice money early on in your game to give you a little bit of a boost for your playthrough. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And once again, please let me know in the comments if there's anything that you would like to know, any kind of Baldur's Gate videos you would like me to make to explain anything to you that you might need some help with. Thanks. Have a good one.